Good morning, everyone. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, my name is John. Oh, thanks, mate. Uh, my name is John, and before we dive in, let's let's pray. Father God, as we come to your word this morning, we ask that by the power of your spirit, you would open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, our hearts to receive, and our wills to respond to the glory and goodness of the gospel. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Great. Well, do have your Bibles open on those pages or, or your phones. Uh, you can't turn a phone, can you? Have it on the right page, whatever. Uh, this morning we come to what is one of the most important chapters of the whole Bible. In fact, I'm going to go as far as to say this morning that if the events outlined in this chapter hadn't taken place, then it'd be extremely unlikely that any of us would be sat here this morning. It's doubtful that there would be a Christchurch Stockport or indeed any church here in Stockport or the UK for that matter. Now I've not gone mad and this isn't hyperbole, uh, nor is it the kind of false teaching that Jude warned us about last week. You see the thing is, without Acts chapter 10, we won't live in a society or a culture founded on the ethics and principles of the Bible. We wouldn't necessarily know about any of those other really important fundamental chapters of the Bible. We wouldn't know about the incarnation or the cross or the, the resurrection of Jesus or anything else. At least not in any kind of meaningful way outside of a comparative RE lesson in school. Because up to this point in the book of Acts, the story of the church, Christianity had been limited to Jewish converts in Judea and a handful of their Semitic cousins in Samaria. And that's because the church had sprung out of Jerusalem, out of Israel, out of Jewish culture. In fact, it was originally considered a sect of Judaism. Consequently, whilst there was a, a bit of a hurdle to get the gospel over to Samaria in chapter 8, the gospel now faced a seemingly impenetrable cultural barrier. Now look with me at verse 28 of chapter 10, where Peter says this. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. Or again, over the page in verse 1 of chapter 11, we read this. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles, that is, those who aren't Jewish, had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? Do you see this? For, for ethnic Jews to mix with Gentiles wasn't just improbable, but mission impossible. No right-minded Jew would ever consider crossing the enormous cultural and ethnic divide to reach out to the Gentiles. They wouldn't even share a sandwich with them. But that makes us ask the question, why is that? Well, it's true that God had chosen the Jews as his own people. And yes, he'd given them certain laws about being separate from the other nations around them. But this distinction was never meant simply as a means unto itself. It, it certainly wasn't so they could big themselves up. The Jews' privileged status was only granted so that they could be a light to the nations. Sadly, though, by the time of the New Testament, the Jews had lost that bigger picture, the, this noble calling. And instead, they turned God's selection of them into his rejection of everybody else. They'd understood their privileged status as a justification for pride and prejudice. And sadly, lumbered with this cultural baggage, even ethnic Jews who had converted to Christianity, like Peter, like he says, would never associate with or even visit anyone of another nation. And yet wonderfully, here in Acts chapter 10, God counters and corrects this gross misunderstanding. God graciously intervenes and orchestrates events so that no one can be left in any doubt that God and the gospel are for everybody. God and his gospel are for everyone. So consequently, the first thing we need to understand from this chapter is that because God and his gospel are for everyone, God himself will ensure that his gospel message will reach everyone. In other words... It is God's mission to reach the nations. It is God's mission to reach the nations. It, it's God's desire to reach out to the nations. It's, it's his drive, his, his initiative, and it always has been. 
So from uh, Genesis to Revelation, God has consistently shown his desire to gather a people from every nation. Uh, Let me give you some examples. Uh, The promise of Genesis 12. Whilst it's primarily for Abraham and his descendants, it is that Abraham uh, would, sorry, that through Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Or what about 1 Kings chapter 8? As King Solomon dedicates the temple in Jerusalem, he prays wisely that God would maintain the cause of his people Israel. That is, that they would make known to all peoples on earth that the Lord is God and there is no other. Or Isaiah chapter 66. When Isaiah prophesies that a day is coming when God would gather a people and send them back out to the nations, to the coastlands far away that have not heard of his fame or seen of his glory, and they shall declare his glory among the nations. This, this truth is made even more explicit in the New Testament. So in Matthew 28, when Jesus sets out the mission priority of his church, he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And even here in the book of Acts, Jesus' final command before his ascension into heaven is, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The Bible is clear. Bible history is clear. God is for everyone. It is and always has been his mission to reach the nations. And therefore God himself will ensure that the message of the gospel will reach the ends of the earth. I don't know about you, but for me that's a great encouragement as we think about the part we play in mission and evangelism. It's great, isn't it, to first remember that it's God's mission. It's his initiative. And in one sense, we just need to get on board with him and go where he wants his message to go. Well, back in Acts chapter 10, and clearly God wants his gospel to go to the nations. So he sets about dismantling this man-made barrier between Jew and Gentile, proving once for all that the gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. Now, chapter 10 consists of two scenes that are being played out concurrently. You've got Cornelius and Co in Caesarea and Peter and Pals over in Joppa. And these two locations themselves are quite telling. So as its name suggests, Caesarea is the city of Caesar. It's the outpost of Rome in the ancient Near East. And as a city, you couldn't get more Roman, more Gentile, more typically non-Jewish. And in Caesarea, we're introduced to Cornelius, who himself is not just any old Gentile, but a Roman centurion nonetheless. So Cornelius then lived in and lived as a representation of everything that the Jews were prejudiced against. Now, let's be fair on Cornelius. Luke tells us in verse 2 of chapter 10 that he was actually a bit of a decent fella. He says he was a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Now, as the chapter unfolds, we're going to see that this description doesn't mean that Cornelius was a Christian, that he was converted. Rather, it means that he'd heard something of the God of the Bible, and and his interest was more than simply intrigue. He'd he'd actually invested in God. Luke says, doesn't he, that he prayed continually. Which, again, incidentally, that's an interesting thought, isn't it, for anyone who wants to know more about God? You know, if you yourself or or one of your friends shows a genuine interest in Christianity, then sure, we should provide tracts and books and point to websites and give invitations to Christianity Explored. Yes, we, we really do need to do all of that. And we must do that. But should we not also suggest that they simply pray to God? You know, pray that, that if someone truly wants to meet with God, then then why not just ask him to reveal himself? What was it that Jesus said? Ask, seek, knock. And the door will be open for you. We see here in Acts 10 that Cornelius' prayers are seemingly answered. So in verse 3, God gives him this vision of an angel. And consistent with other angelic appearances in the Bible, Cornelius is terrified. And yet the angel, in recognition of Cornelius' desire to connect with God, tells him simply to just send men to Joppa to get Simon, who is also called Peter, who happens to be staying with Simon, who fortunately is not also called Peter. And so obediently, Cornelius does as he's told. 
Now, meanwhile, over in Joppa, we find the aforementioned Simon, who is called Peter, going about his daily business. Now, like I said, it's also significant that Peter finds himself at Joppa at this time. Because the last time we heard of Joppa in the Bible, we find that it was the place that Jonah headed to when he was fleeing from his own God-given mission to the Gentiles in Nineveh. And just as Jonah, the reluctant prophet, found out, there's no use going against God, going against his mission. As we've already said today, if God so desires it, then the gospel will go where he wants it to go. Well, similarly with Peter, whilst he's not in active rebellion like Jonah, He was somewhat unconsciously, passively, reluctant to head to the Gentiles. So to shake things up, verse 9, Peter having something somewhat of a lazy day, he finds himself praying on the roof at lunchtime. Now, clearly hungry, he falls into a trance and he imagines this incredible buffet coming out of the sky. I say he imagined it, but Luke assures us that this vision is from God, not simply from his gut. And on this mighty, meaty smorgasbord is is every kind of animal, including birds and reptiles. And this voice calls out, go on then, Peter, get stuck in, kill and eat. Now, Peter, being a good Jew, realises there's a little bit of a problem. You see, he can't just kill and eat anything. Because throughout the Old Testament, God had given laws and provisions for which animals could and couldn't be eaten. Those that were clean and acceptable for food and those that were unclean and therefore forbidden. So Peter raises a reasonable objection to his heavenly maitre d'. I I can't eat this. Send it back to the kitchen, please. What does he say? I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean, verse 14. But the voice replies a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. It's interesting, isn't it? In verse 16, Luke tells us that this whole scenario actually played itself out three times. You see, even though the message seemed pretty clear and concise... Well, I guess Peter, like me, I think I might have needed some convincing before I tucked into a raccoon rump steak or a bit of poached panda. Well, as Peter comes to, probably relieved that it was actually all just a dream, as he's pondering what it meant, verse 17, the men who were sent by Cornelius suddenly turn up at the uh, the gate and they're shouting out for him. But either on hearing or still slightly hazy from his trance or perhaps just confused by which particular Simon was being requested this time, Or actually maybe considering the context. On hearing foreign sounding voices, Peter hesitates. Luke seems to suggest, doesn't there, that there's some reluctance here. There's some unwillingness in Peter to actually go and find out who's calling. To find out what they really want. In fact, it requires God's intervention before Peter gets going. Verse 19, the Spirit himself tells Peter, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise up, go down and accompany them without hesitation. For I've sent them. Well, thankfully, this time, Peter doesn't need to be told twice. He goes and listens to the men. He invites them in as guests. And then the following day, he returns with them to Caesarea, where, verse 24, Luke tells us that in the meantime, Cornelius had gathered together all his friends and relatives in anticipation. Now, whilst it's not explicitly stated in the narrative, it becomes clear that by this point, most likely with the Spirit's prompting, Peter had joined the dots between his mighty, meaty vision and this meeting with Cornelius. So look at what he says in verse 28. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Do you see that? Peter has put two and two together. The dream wasn't really about going around eating panda bears. Although the dream does prove that there's nothing off the menu anymore. No, the dream was primarily a reminder about who calls the shots. About who it is who actually decides what is clean and what is unclean. And as Peter realises that, as he was reminded that that God's mission is actually to reach all people, he then realised just how offensive it is to claim that there are those who are clean and those who are unclean. How wrong it is to suppose that anyone is is inferior or less deserving of the gospel. Look at verse 34. He says, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. God and the gospel are for everyone, 
for everyone of every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people. And as if to prove this, verse 44, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard. Just as in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, just as in Samaria in Acts chapter 8, so again now, at the start of the journey of the gospel going to the ends of the earth, the Spirit falls. And Cornelius and his household are baptised. God shows no partiality. The gospel is for all. The gospel is for the Gentiles. And the gospel is going to the Gentiles. God decreed it. The giving of the Spirit confirmed it. And finally in chapter 11, as, as Peter retells this whole story again back in Jerusalem, the culturally Jewish apostles and brothers could finally accept it. Just, just turn with me quickly to chapter 11 verse 18. When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Guys, the gospel is for all. God shows no partiality. No one is any more or any less deserving of hearing, receiving and responding to the gospel. Now, I think this is great news for any of us here this morning. Do you know what? For, for one, it means none of us have to worry about fitting the mould or, or coming from the right background because there is no mould or background other than being human. The gospel is a great leveller. But, you know, this reality actually forces us to ask another more serious question. And that is like Peter. Maybe we need to do some soul searching and ask God for help. Because human nature would suggest that there will be other man-made barriers that we've put up either consciously or unconsciously. There will be other biases and prejudice that we've either wittingly or unwittingly fallen into. Now, I don't think anyone here this morning at Christchurch Stockport would be so crass as to have explicit prejudices against different people groups or, or different nations. But if nothing else, this passage reminds us that these prejudices exist. They are in here. And yet, if the gospel is truly for all, and we truly believe that it's for all, then we must be motivated to cross cultural barriers, either physically or metaphorically, to see the gospel reach the ends of the earth. So the question is, will we be prepared to go in Jesus' name and in the Spirit's strength to, those, to, to all those and show no partiality like our Heavenly Father? Will we invest our time and our energy into people? And not just the people like us, but actually whoever the gospel places before us. Will we invest our money and our mouths in mission and evangelism? Will we support missionaries and ministries at home and abroad? Will we pray that God would truly reach all nations? Who then in a year's time, in ten years' time, in, in a hundred years' time, We'll look back and thank God that we at Christchurch Stockport crossed those cultural barriers just like Peter did in Acts 10. Here's a brief thought for you. I only offer this as a thought. But perhaps this is maybe one way to start this journey. One of the problems as outlined by Peter at the start of this chapter is that Jews and Gentiles couldn't meet and eat together. But we all know and have experienced the power and enjoyment of sharing a meal with others, haven't we? We know how disarming actually eating a meal together can be. So why not be thinking about who you could invite round for dinner one night? And not just the usual suspects, or those that you find it really easy to be with, or, or even others of us from church. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't be inviting each other round for tea. We, we definitely should be. But are there others we could also be inviting? Are there people from work? People from our streets? People from our sports or social clubs, people from the school game. Are the people from other cultural backgrounds, from other countries or classes? Who could we be inviting into our homes, inviting into our lives to begin to share the good news of Jesus with? It's just a thought. But here's the final thing that we learn from this brilliant chapter. You see, it's not enough actually to just invite someone round. It's not simply enough to simply be nice to people. And it's not enough for people simply to be nice. What I mean is this. Cornelius was a good egg, wasn't he? He was a decent bloke. 
In many ways, he was halfway there. He had an appreciation and understanding of God. But that wasn't enough. And in going to Cornelius, uh, Peter demonstrated kindness, verse 33. It was, it was a really nice and, and generous thing of him to do, to go and meet with the Gentile Cornelius. But again, that in itself wasn't enough. No, there was a bigger, more glorious purpose to this visit. You see, that Peter needed to speak of, and Cornelius needed to hear, the gospel of Jesus. And that's because the gospel must be proclaimed to all. Now, in verses 37 to 43, Peter gives Cornelius this potted summary of the gospel, the, the good news of Jesus. Uh, that, that although he, Jesus, was clearly anointed by God to do good and heal the sick, he was nevertheless put to death on the cross. But God raised him from the dead, and he appeared to many like Peter, whom he commissioned to preach and testify. In other words, to proclaim this message. Look at verse 42. The message that... Jesus is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness, and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the message that Peter needed to speak, that Cornelius and his household needed to hear. This is the good news that will save. See, it's not enough simply to be nice to people, and it's not enough for people to simply be nice. They've got to hear, receive, and respond to the gospel. So we as a church need to remember then that mission isn't simply just providing money to the poor or giving clothing to refugees or providing activities for young people. Now, of course, it can include all of those things. They're all very important. As Christians, we're commanded to be charitable. It's desirable for us to be indispensable within our communities. But at the heart of mission... There must be the words, the words that point people to Jesus and explain who he is and what he has done. But it's also a reminder too that it's not enough to simply look the part. So you can be nice. You can know of God. You can talk of God. You can even talk to God. You can be charitable and kind and well respected and yet miss out on salvation. Salvation is founded, is predicated on hearing and knowing that Jesus is both Saviour and Lord. So here's another question for us to ponder. When we're speaking to others about our faith, do we only speak vaguely of God or do we speak of the Lord Jesus? I remember being challenged on this at university where I once gave my testimony but forgot to mention Jesus once. Yet it's him who we must proclaim. It's him who we must point people to. It's him who people must respond to. Brothers and sisters, CCS, as we work out how to join God in his mission to reach the nations, as we seek to make disciples of all nations and be witnesses to the ends of the earth, Acts 10 shows us that it will mean nothing less than telling people about Jesus, about his life, about his death, about his resurrection, about his lordship, in order to bring them to the forgiveness of sins. So guys, let's make sure that in everything we do, we proclaim clearly the identity, the purpose, and the glorious offer of Jesus Christ. Now let's pray now. Father God, this morning we may well have been presented with our inevitable, explicit and implicit prejudices. So we ask then that, like the Apostle Peter, that you would confront, challenge and change us in the light of the Gospel. <clears throat> Father, we ask that you would give us hearts that don't simply accept others, but desire to see all nations reached and saved by and for the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, may Jesus be our foundation. May he be our all. May he be the one who draws us together and makes us one. Amen.